Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here today to talk to you about light, but light in, from a very different perspective than you're used to. In the United States, if you lose electricity, you rarely lose light because you have, have access to flashlights, emergency power generators, and maybe even enough scattered light from a nearby town or a neighbor. If you're in the middle of nowhere and there's no moon and there's no sun, then it's pitch black. It's like being blind. And the only way that you can move around right, is by touch alone. If you've ever experienced that, then you know that with a tiny little bit of light, right, you can do an awful lot. With a little bit more light, you can do much more. You can read and you can be productive. So I'm here today really as a, it's, it's an accident. It's a, a series of unimagined coincidences and unintended consequences. And it really all started in 1958 when my parents took, took me to uh, Africa. My father was a doctor, so we lived on the, in the hospital compound. And if we were lucky, sometimes we got access to electricity and water. But other times, we had to make do with kerosene. And when you've lived among the extreme poor, right, it leaves a mark on you. I used to go to school up there, and, and the people that I went to I shared a class with were the poorest people on the planet. And thanks to them, I almost learned how to shoot bats with a catapult, but I was never that successful. <coughs> but once you've lived with extreme poverty, you're always aware of it, not in a bad sense, but you know, here today, you know that there are hundreds of millions of people right, with access to very little. Now, I am very fortunate to teach at Cooper Union, which is a, a small university a few blocks south of here, and one of the things that I always wanted to do was to introduce students right, to extreme poverty, to Africa, to doing more with less. And so today, this is really the story about how this all happened. So if you look at the world at night, then it's easy to see Africa. It's still, in 2011, it's still a dark continent. Despite the fact that there have been huge uh, advances in infrastructure and communications, and if you go to the capital cities of most African countries, you can still just about order uh, pizza over Wi-Fi. But if you go out into the bush, very little has changed in the, in the past uh, several hundred years. And I go back to Africa. I've been going back to Africa for the last 10 years, to the place where I used to live. And apart from the fact that the people now have access to clean water, which means that you don't see kids walking around painted uh, purple with gentian violet, and guinea worm is almost gone. Once you get off the beaten track, very little has changed in the past 50 years. And in a way, the, having watched the, the, the growth of African countries, the, the gap between the, the rich and the poor has got wider and wider. The previous speaker talked about people all coming off the poverty line. And if you go to a capital city, you're things have advanced so fast that you can almost believe that you're in a, a European city. But once you get off the beaten track, as I said, things are very different. If you go to the capital cities, you'll see them buzzing. You'll see SUVs buzzing around, carrying their occupants from air-conditioned office to air-conditioned house. But where we go, you rarely ever see these people. <coughs> if you're really poor, with, there's a lot of talk about people with a dollar a day, and nowadays, in some ways, that has been raised to two dollars a day. But there are people out there who earn less than 25 cents a day. And when you earn that amount of money, you can't afford the one dollar fifty or so a week for kerosene. You have to rely on what's known as a fantilla, which is really just a bent piece of metal shaped into a container into which you put shea nut butter, and into this you stuff a cotton wick. And this is your foul, smelly source of light. And these people aren't really even on the radar. They're below the base of the pyramid. And it is these people right, for which we set out to um, do some engineering. So one thing that is staggering is that 20% of the world's population, or one in five people, in fact, more than one in five people, doesn't have access to a clean source of light. I think this is staggering, especially nowadays when you consider how prevalent telecommunications are. So in 2005, I was on my fourth trip to Ghana, and we hadn't really had a lot of success in uh, doing something productive. And I was talking to a lecturer from one of the universities, and I explained that I wanted a, to do a project which 
involved a real partnership with the people over there that was potentially useful and that didn't cost a lot of money. And he said very simply, well, the communities don't have light. And of course they don't have light. But then you look around and you think, well, why don't they have light? Because there's lots and lots of people out there who are working on lighting systems right, for very poor people. But when you get out into the middle of nowhere, right, you don't see these lighting systems. So I then started to think about, is it possible to design a lighting system right, which actually addresses the needs of the people who aren't even on the radar? In 2006, I was actually given the first year, first semester engineering class. And the format is that each, each five lecturers get up and pose their, put their project forward. And I very, uh, uh, with a certain amount of trepidation, put forward design a lighting system for the poorest people on the planet. Uh, and the lighting source, the lantern, should cost less than $10. It should go for two days without a recharge. And it should be something that is, uh, is a must-have for the people who, who want it. And to my surprise, nearly a third of the class put it down as their first choice. So after we'd evened out the sections, uh, 24 students, one of whom is here today, sat down to try and design a flashlight, sorry, a light source, which would act as a flashlight, a general light, right, and a reading light. And one of the overriding themes of this exercise was that it, it had to be something that you could sell. If anyone's read The Ugly American by Homer Atkins, you know that Homer Atkins says, if you give a man something, then the first person he'll come to dislike is you, right? And if it's going uh, to work, it has to be their lamp, right? Not my lamp. He was actually talking about pumps. So we embarked on this uh, project. And to try and put this into perspective, I asked the class to imagine themselves, right, that they were in Africa, to think about designing this in a place where you had very few resources, where you didn't have FedEx and UPS trucks, right, which delivered on a daily basis, and you couldn't just nip into town, right, and buy a spare part. And I think that, you know, putting it in this setting, right, meant that people started to think about the design in a different way. And I think it was because of this that we ended up where we are today. So what do first-year students right, know about LEDs and electronics and solar panels and everything else? Well, they don't really know much, to be honest. So we started off at the high end, thinking about you know, the overall system. We thought a little bit about the lamps. And as all engineering students know, you have to start making compromises. One of the things that we wanted to do um, first off was to try and bring the cost down. So, most conventional solar lantern systems right, have a, a panel which serves one lamp. So to reduce the cost, we decided that we'd have a community-based system and we would have one panel right, which, which charged all the lanterns in the community. And so this was their first effort. Right? And in most conventional design classes, this would probably be a failure, right? but it brought a tear to my eye because the people, had, the students had got it right. If you look at the lantern on the left, it's got bamboo. The main window is solar soda bottles. The reflectors and other bits of the solar, the soda bottle coated with aluminum foil. Right? It's not terribly robust, but they got the principle. They made something which was easily repairable, easily made, right, and used local resources. And you can see that they looked at that, and then they went to the second design, but for our purposes, that was already getting too complicated. Who would use all that studying in such a wasteful way? <clears throat> so a few of the students asked if they could continue with the uh, project. And uh, like, why not? It's a, a good thing to do. And then as we got ready for the next trip to Africa, we thought, well, perhaps we should actually go and try this. You know? So if you're going to do anything like this, you have to have a local champion. And we have a local champion. He's called Blandina Batir. And she used to share a desk with my sister 50 years ago. So without her, we wouldn't have been able to do any of this. So we arranged a community meeting right, with the village of, of Nambeg. And we went there because they taught us how to make pots a couple of years ago. And they all assembled under a mango tree. And as we arrived, they danced and sang right, to welcome the Nasala, right, the white man. So we asked them, we explained what we wanted to do, and we asked them if they'd help us um, design the system. And 
Everybody put up at one hand, most people put up two hands. It was a very humbling moment. So then we set to work to try and find out what people would actually use light for. And unless you've actually been in a situation where you don't have access to light, you don't really understand. And I don't think any of us who'd started this off really understood where this project was going to go or what we were going to find out. We didn't really understand the pivotal role of women or the pivotal role of the chiefs, and we didn't understand how people would use the light or what they would do with the lantern. So it then came to the end of the summer and time to leave, and we looked at our three lanterns, one of which was good, the one on the right, because it had been made, um, the housing had been made by somebody in the community because they were potters, but altogether we had three lamps. It was a far cry from the lighting system that we'd promised them. So we talked about it a bit and said, should we just quietly walk away and come back next year when we've done it properly, or should we leave them? But we decided to leave them because we thought we'd learned something. The next thing was leave, leaving the solar panels. And before we'd left, I'd talked to an expert on this, and he'd said, you're going to put solar panels on a, a house in the middle of the bush? I said, yes. He said, you're crazy. He said, they'll be gone in the morning. And I said, if they have, we'll have learned something. But nowadays, as soon as somebody says you're crazy, then I think perhaps we're not so crazy after all. And the EPA didn't, didn't think we were crazy either, because while we were there, they gave us a P3 grant, which meant that we could then uh, make re-engineer right, everything and make proper circuits a proper charging system. So you can see, right, this was still the original charging system we replaced. That was January. We then went back, right, the following summer and uh, got the field results back. And there were good things, right, there were not so good things, and there were completely unexpected things. The good thing was that a lot of the lanterns were still working, and people had actually felt um, they'd taken ownership of them right, and coloured them. This, we call this Dave's Lantern, who's actually sitting in the audience, because uh, he designed it. The not-so-good things that were people had taken the top off right, and bypassed the circuitry and completely flattened the battery to run radios, charge phones, and other things. The unexpected things were fights and funerals. The uh, people in Nambeg were very popular... Uh, guests at weddings and funerals, but they were, they were asked to come, and it's please make sure you'll bring your lantern as well. When we left the first lanterns, we naively asked people to share the lanterns between, between the households, you know, use it for two or three weeks and then pass it on. And we were so naive, I mean, why would you give away a source of light, right, once you had it? So there were actually fist fights over the lanterns. I don't think anybody was seriously injured, but we knew we had a, a market. And about this time, we started to think a little bit about where we were, because this thing was starting to take off at a, at a pace that none of us had really envisaged. So I don't know whether anybody's ever walked into a room which is being lit by a kerosene lantern. Well, this was, it was about 100 degrees outside in this room. It stank, the air was foul, and all the things that you read about kerosene lighting are true. And this, about this time, somebody else thought we weren't quite as crazy either. And the NCI gave us some money, and the NCI makes you think about this as a business. So we stopped to take uh, uh, account of where we were, and we decided that um, what we designed was generally durable, it was maintainable, it was probably accessible, and it was sustainable to a certain extent. We hadn't thought too much about the money yet. <coughs> But the real goal of that, the visit that summer was, you know, we wanted to, to put a lighting system in a suitcase. We wanted to be able to deliver light right, to people in the middle of nowhere in such a way that they actually played an integral role in, in building it and under, putting it together and, to a certain extent, some of the design. So we came up with the, uh, this idea of lighting system in a suitcase. And up at the top, you can see the duffel bag and in the duffel bag is everything you need to make an 80 lantern system, apart from the batteries and the uh, housings, which are housed locally. And up on the upper right-hand side, you can see some of the people that we trained to do this. So we literally went out right, into the middle of nowhere with, with some tools and some instructions and sat under a mango tree and taught people how to make circuits because we wanted to, to uh, give people the power to 
um, make their own lighting systems. And once you have this kind of thing, then you uh, have a lot of opportunity right, for local business. So the whole point of this was to go and start far away from the capital cities, right, with all the NGOs and all the people with sticky fingers, and let people in the middle of nowhere understand that they don't have to wait for trickle-down aid, that, you know, with the right encouragement, they can actually start to have a part in, the, in their destiny. And if you want to deliver this system, you know, you don't have to worry about whether you've got a road or anything like that. You can just put the system on your head, right, and you can carry it out into the middle of nowhere. And so the overall idea of this is that you, you start off somewhere and you make some lighting systems and you teach people how to do it, who then maintain, right, the villages around them. And then you start to extend, and once you get more than, say, a day's uh, travel between two villages, you set up another, you train people in another village so that they can start assembling the lighting systems and maintaining them and uh, uh, doing any repairs and things like that. So in this way, potentially, you can spread out and cover a whole country, something like the east of the Congo, where you've got hundreds of thousands of square kilometers with no light or no electricity. And so, where are we today? Well, we've got a solution which we have called Socialite. Um, we think we've proved the engineering, we think we've proved the lantern design, we think we've proved the operation, and we think we've proved the business model, but not quite all at the same time. And if you do anything like this, then when you start off, it's very easy to think that you've done something wrong, because things do go wrong. And you need to make sure that you don't let them derail you. Like, in the beginning, who would have thought that kids would come into the lighting uh, place where the, the charging station was right, and literally pull everything together? Who would think that you needed to think about leaving a door open right, to stop a goat going in right, and chewing a cable? So to, the begin, to begin with, you get very disillusioned. But as you move on, you realize that you can't think of anything and that it's better to move forward. And that every now and then you'll take a pace forward or you'll see a student come back whose axis is tilted. And this is one of these lanterns. And the bottom is an old tub of hair relaxer, right? The top is an old tin of, uh, sorry, an old bottle of fruit juice, both of these being bought off the local market empty because the people couldn't afford them full, right, for literally a few cents. And then there's a, one bicycle spoke at the top, right, and two bicycle spokes down here. And this was designed by the students at Wild Polytechnic. In New York, we made the inside circuit, but the students at Wild Polytechnic did this. And it basically has a, a charging jack, right, and a button for high and low. But perhaps the good thing about it, right, is that you can drop it, right, and you can pick it up again. And if one of these things breaks, you can just go to the local market and repair it, right? If you get any of these cheap Chinese or other imports, they're so fragile that if I'd have dropped it, we'd have just swept it up right, and pushed it out, out of the way. <clears throat> so then we come to who, who are the markets. So th this, this woman has just walked six kilometers, and the wood on her head weighs about 30 kilograms. She's going to sell that wood for 70 cents. She's then going to use that 70 cents right, to feed and clothe her family. And then she's going to walk right, five kilometers back to the village. And she's going to do this as many days in the year as she can to actually get some currency. So we see getting the lantern to people like her as our goal. And uh, the more rapidly we can do it, and, you know, the, the, the more we will we'll have succeeded, but much more we want her to take the lighting system, right, and then take possession of it, right, and start introducing it to her community. And lest anybody think this conversation is a one-way conversation, after she'd walked these six kilometers, she stopped, right, and she greeted us with this huge load on her head. And if we'd met her later in the day with her one plate of food, right, her one meal of the day, she would have automatically said, share my, share my food. And if we'd been sick, right, she would have uh, looked after us. But much more than anything, people like this woman who's earns virtually nothing who's, you know, nobody even thinks about, knows much more about sustainability than we'll ever know. She can make something go further than any of us can even imagine. And so 
We then come to what is engineering for the middle of nowhere? Well, I think that we've discovered that it has to be the best engineering in the world. When we started this project off, I remember my dean saying to me, Toby, it's just a lantern. And it's like, yes, but it has to work you know, in the most extreme conditions. And we've certainly discovered that you know, as we've moved down the line, that you have to take into account all the things that you would never consider over here. So it has to be really good engineering. It has to be very robust. It has to be easily repairable. It has to be um, use as many local resources as possible. And uh, the biggest thing of all is that if you need to be there to make it work, right, you've failed. And if you, if you move across Africa, you see it littered with old cars, pumps, every, all the uh, merchandise that we you know, have at hand in the United States. But over there, most of it's broken. Right? So you've got all this useless global engineering right, which litters the African continent. So in conclusion, Everybody knows, or I presume everybody here, knows that we have huge challenges of energy, water, and shelter. And we use stupid metrics like LEED right, to tell us that we're doing something sustainable. If we really want to learn about sustainability, I think we need to go back to the African bush right, to talk to the people who live there. This is in southern, southern Mali, where everything that they need for their survival right, has to be at hand. If you think about it, humankind started in Africa. Maybe we should go back to Africa right, to learn from them so that we can then keep going. Thank you.